Hi, I'm Cheryl Brunette, and today we're going to explore wet felting, and I'm going to share a secret with you from a professional felter friend of mine that I have never seen anywhere else. Internet, books, nowhere. First, let me catch you up on my Kickstarter campaign to build a studio on my property that's going on right now. If you have already backed that project, thank you so much. And if you haven't, and if you've ever gotten help from my videos or saved time or learned a new technique that really made your finished product look better, please back it now. This is your chance to support not only my work, but to support it being free on YouTube for as long as I can do it. Thanks. Now back to our regular programming, wet felting. I noticed you, you probably didn't notice this hat that I'm wearing, right? Well, I made this about a month ago at a workshop that a friend um, took me to. It was, it was my birthday present, which my birthday isn't now, but she took me because the workshop was happening now. And this is my very first wet felting project that was done with Merino roving. Let me show you. It was done with a resist. This is the resist that we started with. This, look at the size of the hat compared to this. We <clears throat> laid the roving on here in various ways and folded it over the top. And we had to be very careful not to get a crease because you don't want a crease on the top of your thing. And how do we do this fancy little thing here? That was another piece that after we felted a certain amount of this, we added that onto it um, as a decorative piece. And we put the resist in because we didn't want the two sides of the hat to felt together. And let me tell you, this was a really rigorous project. We stood and kind of rubbed it and beat it and did all kinds of things to it for an entire day. <laughs> and so by the time I went home that night, my hat was still wet. And so uh, my friend Nita and I wore our hats home because they were still damp, but um, and it helped to stretch them out. But honestly, I just conked out because it was hard work. Okay, so another example of felted fabric. Let's throw that down. Here's something that I actually would call fold. This is a jacket that I believe is woven and it has a lovely texture to it. I, it could possibly be knit because it has some flexibility and, um, but it, it isn't like the regular flat felt that you buy in the fabric store. Um, which has been pressured and, and rolled and sometimes ironed and steamed and all those things. This, this is what we would call, when I was living in Germany, we would call this boiled wool because it's got this nice texture. And it's very cozy. It's a very sweet jacket. Let's see. Oh, and then this, this is kind of messy. I know. This, in fact, it's really messy. But these are the baskets. Um, that are rewards that I'm making for the Kickstarter project. If you are not a knitter or you are a knitter and you want to buy them as gifts. I have made at almost two dozen of these as gifts for my friends and family and I love them. They are cat boardies designed from the second treasury of magical knitting. And it is a wonderful book and it's available as an ebook. I had been borrowing it from my library and I was terrified that it was going to get lost. And fortunately, Kat brought it back as an ebook. And I'm going to put a link below so that you can link directly to that. All kinds of wonderful, interesting, cunning things in that um, book. This is a knitted basket cat's design magical basket it's a mobius and it's even it's so cunningly um, crafted how you put it together you start by making this rim up here and you split this and open it up and build the bowl down so this is what it looks like this is manos del uruguay and um uruguay i think and it has it w went through three times through my washing machine this is the same yarn at the top and this is what it looks like when it's just knitted. You can see there's quite a bit of difference. 
this is a little bit of my effort at ombre I had left over here and um, this Monostel Uruguay is really a beautiful hand spun thick and thin yarn and so it gives the baskets I, I love them this I think is the yarn that she called for I happen to have a lot of it and it is um, it makes for such a lovely texture not only is it thick and thin so you get a, an interesting texture to the surface of it but it also is striated it's hand kettle dyed so the colors are not just plain here's another one i am a sparkle plenty girl i put i wrapped this with the yarn that monos that went through it so these two are in needing to be felted here's another one again the same monos del uruguay processed about the same amount of time and you, it depends on how tightly you want to felt this um but notice the difference in size and it's the exact same amount of yarn and it's the same company well if it's not the exact same i haven't actually weighed it um but the dyes and other things can determine how it felt. So, so many variables. Here's another one that's another Manos, and I used a sparkle yarn with it. It was this blue. This blue is not Manos de Uruguay. This is a commercially spun yarn, and it's a little bit smoother. It's a little bit um, firmer. And this one I've been processing the heck out of this one, and it still hasn't, I mean, it's felted, but it hasn't gotten any body yet. And it was a combination of this wool and this mohair. And now that I've worked with it, I can see that this is, um, this probably has some nylon as the binder in it, which is why it isn't felting as readily. This one is another, hand spun one and this is quite firm this was a thick and thin spun up here on the islands up on orcas island i think and died and this one came out very tidily and this is <laughs> this one see what happens when you put synthetic this is synthetic um i don't think this is called eyelash this is the other stuff it's i don't know the furry stuff but i had a commercial white yarn that i loved a creamy white norwegian yarn and i combined it with that and even as it shrunk up um it it did this and i just thought it was so cute so let's look more closely at why things felt Felt is probably the oldest fabric used by humans because of the nature of animal hair or wool. It has scales. In fact, even human hair has scales, and that's how people get dreadlocks. Um, they just rub it together like crazy and, and felt it. And when these scales are subjected to friction, pressure, moisture, heat, they start to retract and they can catch one another. And when they catch one another and fit together, that makes the dense fabric. And by the way, once those scales have retracted, they don't come back out. Don't think that you can um, do something with a felted sweater, like uh, do something to make it come back. <laughs> it, it, I mean, I've heard people say, oh, put it in vinegar and do other stuff. Maybe, I don't know, maybe there's a miracle resurrection. And if you find out about it, let me know. But I've never seen it happen. Um, so let's look at, this is an electron microscope um, set of pictures. This is so cool. This is a, from a book that was in 1906. I got this from the Gutenberg Project. Um, on the internet, and it was called, the book was called The Chemistry of Hat Manufacturing, and it was based on a series of lectures from the 1880s, and they used to look under a microscope and draw these very carefully, and look at how carefully they match these. So, we had the technology before. Okay, so this is a coarse wool. This is a fine wool. 
Here's alpaca. Alpaca always, to me, feels a little bit silky. And of course, depending on the um, what the animal eats and where it's grown and the temperature, this is not um, an absolute description of every fiber of an alpaca, for example. Here's cashmere. See how it has fewer, which means, of course, that it's going to be smoother. There's silk. Looks like a ribbon, and that helps to give it its sheen because it can reflect. Here's linen. It's rough, but it will not. It, it's not scaly rough, so it will not felt at all. Cotton is a very interesting fiber to me. It has a twist to it. So that's kind of interesting. And there's your polyester, which comes out. It's basically a kind of, I don't know if it's a true plastic or not, but it shoots out of a spinneret like a, like a um, spider has. And so it's very smooth. And that clearly won't felt. So you could felt this in a lot of different ways to bring friction, moisture, and heat to it, right? You could you could get a buffalo pelt or a bear pelt and put it down for a bed and after perspiration and um, rolling around on it and your body heat, it would felt up and you would see that. Or you could do what they do to make a yurt, which they beat the heck out of some coarse wool and they then lay out a mother felt which is a piece of existing felt. They lay the wool out on it. They, they um, then they put the best wool first. So that's supposed to be the outside. And then after the layers are laid out, they sprinkle it with warm water, which is what we did when I made that hat um, at the workshop. And then they put a pole in the center and roll this whole thing up, wrap it in wet hides, tie it with strong ropes to a couple of horses or camels and drag it across the steps as they go. These are nomads, right? And they go off. So <laughs> they get the friction, they get the heat, they get the, they beat the heck out of it and it makes great wool felt. And, and they stop and check it periodically and where it's um, like thin, they will add more wool, which we were able to do too. The more conventional way, of course, is the way we did this. And I'll, sh I'll show you just really briefly. When we made those hats and used the roving, we she was so good at this, the teacher was. I'm not very good at pulling this out, but she would pull really nice amounts. I think I'm not there, about like that. And we covered this whole thing in this direction. Yeah, more like that. You have to, when you're pulling the um, roving, you have to pull further from further down, which I, I, I only did it once, so I haven't learned this process yet. So we covered it all in this direction, and then we came back and covered it in that direction. But you can see that you can't really put that in a washing machine, or it's very delicate. So then we had a piece of fabric. It was like this one, except it, this is like sparkle fabric, right? Because sparkle plenty here. But this was just um, just some old white sheer curtain fabric that she had, and we put that on top of it then sprinkled it with warm water and soap. It was kiss my face olive oil soap. And then we just rubbed it like crazy and kept rubbing it and rubbing it until it started to go together. And then we did more rigorous things with it. Once it was in, sort of adhering to itself, we could get a little bit crazy, including you put boiling water on it, you slap it down uh, really hard on the surface to make it, to sort of beat it up. And, and this is the knitted one. Notice that um, in order to get the friction that you have to knit this really loosely. Otherwise, these fibers are not gonna rub up against one another quite so much. And here is a nice close-up of this yarn once it's been felted. See that texture? Notice how most of the stitches are pretty much gone. You can see a little bit of line there, um, but mostly it's all one piece. I suppose I could put it through another couple of times, but I'm really happy. Uh, there's something that um, is comforting to me. These are these are like warm. They're comforting. They're um, they're organic. That's why I think living in a yurt would be kind of cool because you would be surrounded by this organic process or this product, and um, and it's also the shape of a circle, which is very comforting for human beings. Curves are 
One thing I learned when I was doing this was, uh, and something that I really hadn't thought about, and it's about superwash wool. This is some um, sock wool, sock it to me from Elan. And the way you get superwash wool is to get rid of these scales, okay? And you do that one of two ways. There is a chemical treatment for that um, in which they dissolve the scales primarily. And then they, there's another way in which they put a kind of resin over it. And so if you take superwash wool and treat it a little bit too harshly and it has the resin, you can actually melt that and it will become not superwash wool anymore. So I think that's about all that I have right here. Here's that. Here's the thick and thin yarn and the holes that will move back and forth so it can get agitated. So it turns out that the professional secret is that you do not have to use hot water and switch it with cold. I have felted all these things in my washing machine and I have only cold water out at my um, laundry shed. It's rainwater, which isn't even very hard. So this was washed three times. This was washed three times. And this might be a little bit bigger. Again, the dye can um, affect it, but also the sparkle maybe has added a little bit to it. This was done three times. This one that still isn't felted or doesn't have enough body, was run through the washing machine four times. And it also depends on what you put in the washing machine with it. If you have a lot of jeans or rough stuff, I had a, a leather jacket that I put through with one of them and it only had to go through twice because the leather jacket, a washable leather jacket of course, um, <clears throat> was able to really agitate this. So it's temperature change is what everyone tells you you have to do. But Kim, who makes all these hats, told me, and she's made hundreds of these hats and she sells them at the farmer's market and other places. And she was the one who told me, you don't, Joe, you don't need warm water. You can do it with cold water. And um, she, now this, I won't swear by, but she says, after years of washing um, hats and other, she did some other um, felted things in her washing machine, with cold water sometimes, with hot water sometimes, she never has put it in a bag or a, um, a pillowcase or anything, and it has not hurt her washing machine. You will read that if you do that, that the fuzz will get into your pump and that sort of stuff. I can't swear to that, but it hasn't happened for Kim, and so far it hasn't happened for me. So that you're just going to have to take your chances with or figure it out yourself or ask your washing machine person, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so I hope you enjoyed what happened today. And let me remind you one more time, please, please back my Kickstarter campaign. I would love to keep offering this programming for free. And I literally cannot do it unless you help and I get a studio on my property. So thanks so much. Um, and until I see you again, be brave and enjoy your knitting. I need to clean this mess up first. <laughs>